Greetings. I'm your presenter, Jessmine Newhouse. Thank you for joining me today. I'm the author of Geeky Pedagogy, a guide for intellectuals, introverts, and nerds who want to be effective teachers. I'm a professor of U.S. history and popular culture at SUNY Plattsburgh and director of Plattsburgh Center for Teaching Excellence. This presentation is a call to action. Let's look to the scholarship of teaching and learning, utilize our wisdom of experience, and draw on the support of our pedagogical communities of practice to fight the scourge of certain persistent, disempowering myths about teaching. Pedagogy nerds, assemble, battling big myths about teaching in troubled times. We're living and teaching during a health, economic, and social crisis that will impact higher education for years to come. Countless college instructors without any previous experience in teaching hybrid or online classes will be required to do exactly that. Almost overnight, online student learning and care for student learning during times of great uncertainty, fear, and trauma have become our top pedagogical priorities. Meanwhile, all of us continue to face unique teaching challenges shaped by our own teaching context, namely our embodied identities, campus cultures, student populations, and employment status. Where do we even begin? To teach effectively in troubled times, we begin by believing in our own abilities to help students learn. At the individual, departmental, and institutional level, we have to know that we can help students keep learning even during enormous upheaval and change. We must be more ready than ever to fight some common, highly detrimental myths about teaching and learning. Myth number one, educational technology is the most important part of online or hybrid course design. Myth number two, content coverage is the most important part of any college class. Myth number three, the best teachers are super teachers. Part one, myth, educational technology is the most important part of hybrid or online course design. Let's start with a little pop quiz. In any online or hybrid class, what do students most need from their instructor? Is it A? Interactive Learning Management Systems. Is it B, Recorded Lectures? Is it C, Funny Memes? Or is it D, Other? The correct answer is D, Other because the most important part of any class is connection. Instructors and students together building and sustaining a learning community. Now, scholars and practitioners of online pedagogy have been shouting this one from the rooftops for years. But if you're new to online learning, it's easy to let the technology take center stage. Let me tell you a story. When I was pregnant with my first child, my significant other and I enrolled in a birthing class offered through our local hospital. I loved it because I, like so many nerdy academics, am a great student. Learning in a classroom setting, that is my jam. One day the teacher asked us to name the single most important thing our newborn baby would need in the first weeks of life, and I started guessing, was it milk, diapers, 
adorable little duckies and onesies? The teacher smiled tolerantly and then proceeded to blow my mind with the correct answer. It's you. The most important thing your baby needs is your love and care. Well, I was flabbergasted, thinking I've never even babysat an infant. I have a PhD in history, but I don't know beans about taking care of a newborn. I'm not an expert. When I said as much, the teacher responded with words that I've always remembered. You may not be an expert on babies, but you will always be the expert on your baby and caring for your baby. Fumbling my way through parenthood, I've often remembered those reassuring words. Caring comes first. Everything else can be learned as you go. It's easy to let educational technology bells and whistles overtake online course planning and to forget that the most important thing our students need is pedagogical care, helping students learn how to do things. Your presence and your care for students' academic success is the most necessary component of your pedagogy on any platform. This is always true of online teaching and learning, but it's particularly important during the kind of turbulence and trauma everyone is experiencing now. You are the expert on your teaching context, so what do you need to do in a face-to-face, -face, online, or hybrid class to help your students increase their skills and abilities. Here are four of the best books from the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning to help us combat myth number one. Derek Bruff, Intentional Tech, Principles to Guide the Use of Educational Technology in College Teaching. Flower Darby with James M. Lang, Small Teaching Online, Applying Learning Science in Online Classes. Catherine E. Linder, The Blended Course Design Workbook, A Practical Guide. Michelle D. Miller, Minds Online, Teaching Effectively with Technology. Okay, you pedagogy geeks and A-plus students, here's the fun stuff. Homework! Faculty, some questions to consider. Planning any class. What are the two or three things I most want students to learn how to do better? What do I already know about my teaching context that's key to facilitating student learning in person and online? How do I convey my care for student learning and success in a hybrid online and or face-to-face -face classroom under normal circumstances? In what ways does that change or remain the same during troubled traumatic times? Educational developers, some questions for you to consider. What do faculty need in order to feel confident about teaching effectively when they are also using new technologies? How can we draw on faculty's wisdom of experience and subject expertise to do this? In what ways do troubled, traumatic times create specific teaching challenges for contingent, underrepresented, and marginalized faculty? How does the demand for hybrid and online course instruction impact academic diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. Part two. Myth. Content coverage is the most important part of any college class. One of the biggest mistakes every egghead expert and academic geek makes at one time or another is trying to cram too much content into a class. Why? It's simple. We love our subjects. Most of us have devoted years to studying our topics, and we love every arcane detail of our specialized scholarly field. Oh, and also we're smarty pants scholars who've been really well trained to show off our big brainedness. But to teach effectively, we always have to give up some content to make enough space and time to ensure that students are learning how to do things with that content. Especially during times of crisis and trauma, knowing how uncertain the future is, we have to focus on the specific ways that we can equip students with knowledge about how to do things. 
We have to remember how long it takes to learn new skills and how much repeated practice it requires. Think of an Olympic medal-winning swimmer trying to show someone who's afraid of water how to dog paddle. Think about how far back into their memory the Olympian has to go to recall what it feels like to be learning how to simply stay afloat. Moreover, think about how differently these two people even perceive a swimming pool. To the Olympian, it's an empowering place of achievement where innumerable hours of passionate, hard work overcoming obstacles and setbacks and increasing their skill has made them extremely successful. To the nervous, novice swimmer, it's a scary, mysterious place of fear and danger. We can't just toss students into the deep end of our subject pool, not without a lot of flotation support anyway. Pedagogical care does not mean a lessening of academic rigor, nor does it mean that effective teachers have to be all warm and fuzzy and, and extroverted. A pedagogy of care for student learning means communicating our expectations clearly to students, demonstrating our approachability, and constantly reviewing, assessing, tweaking, and revising all aspects of our classes to make sure we're doing everything possible to help students succeed. As an introverted and intellectual teacher, I used to worry that I would never be able to successfully implement a pedagogy of care. In the classroom and in my interactions with students, I keep things pretty professional and focused on the academic work. But I care very deeply about student learning. I work hard every day to find ways to help students be academically successful, and I know how to clearly communicate that to my students. For me, in my teaching context, with my student population, I've found ways to demonstrate my pedagogical caring. My pedagogy of care doesn't have to look like yours, but it does need to keep evolving to meet changing needs. Specifically, everyone teaching today must be attentive to the physical and emotional toll that trauma takes on the brain's ability to learn and how housing and food insecurity and other socioeconomic conditions impact students' academic world. We need to be flexible enough in our course planning and assessment of student learning to be able to respond nimbly and humanely to the emergency situations that are going to be arising on an individual, institutional, national, and global level. Here are four great books to help us do exactly that. Sarah Rose Kavanaugh, the Spark of Learning, Energizing the College Classroom with the Science of Emotion. Joshua Eiler, How Humans Learn, The Stories and Science Behind Effective College Teaching. Paul Hanstead, Creating Wicked Students, Designing Courses for a Complex World. James M. Lang, Small Teaching, Everyday Lessons from the Science of Learning. Some questions for us to consider going forward. For faculty, what does my big, highly trained brain do automatically in my subject area that students need a lot of instruction, practice, and time to learn how to do? In troubled traumatic times, what will it take students longer and be even harder for them to learn? How can I ensure that students see the relevance and utility of my subject? For educational developers, what resources and support do faculty need to continue to build their pedagogical content knowledge under extreme duress and during great uncertainty? How do we enable faculty who care deeply about their subject areas identify ways to make that subject relevant to students at a time of so much fear, insecurity, and socioeconomic adversity? because it will be even more crucial during the new normal to reflect on what's working and what isn't, what safe and empowering spaces can we provide for instructors to honestly share and reflect on their pedagogical practices? 
Part 3 Myth The best teachers are super teachers. There's a persistent myth of the super teacher in our culture. It's a highly idealized, narrowly defined, and unrealistic image of what good college teaching and learning looks like. The super teacher is a charismatic, white, cisgendered male professor standing in a packed lecture hall, expounding effortlessly while students magically learn merely by being in his always entertaining presence. In real life, effective teaching and learning almost never looks like that. The super teacher fantasy significantly undermines faculty's belief in their own unique abilities to help students learn. In the spring of 2020, educators everywhere strove mightily to keep teaching and to help students keep learning. But as writer and leadership coach Sherry Spellett cautioned on her blog, Edified Listener, quote, I worry about our educator tendency to respond heroically to the storms with which we are confronted. I worry about our tendency to make lemonade out of lemons, even if there's no sugar in sight to sweeten the deal, end quote. The super teacher myth contributes to this dynamic, goading educators to try to magically transform a big bushel of rotting, sour, stinking lemons into delicious learning lemonade. The best weapon I've found to fight the super teacher myth is a growth mindset. A growth mindset is the understanding that skills and abilities are not fixed inherent qualities, but rather things that we can learn how to do better with knowledge and practice. Teaching with a growth mindset means knowing and constantly reminding yourself that nobody is born an effective teacher. Effective teachers slowly, laboriously accumulate knowledge over time and continually practice pedagogical skills, making mistakes as we go. All of us are always learning how to be an effective teacher, never more so than in the wake of the coronavirus when the structures of higher education themselves are in flux or even serious peril. Right now, thousands of college instructors are engaged in some of the hardest learning we'll ever do. Oh, sure, we've always been learning all the time about our subjects, conducting our research, reading the scholarly literature, and engaging in debates and discussion. But the emergency shift to remote instruction threw many experts into the deep end of the teaching pool. Every day and in every way, instructors were incorporating new information and new technology into our teaching. By the seat of our pants and by the skin of our teeth, we learned on the job as we were doing it how to help students successfully com complete a class in the middle of a global crisis. Continued uncertainty and massively shifting teaching responsibilities have and will continue to force a whole generation of college instructors into feeling a lot like, well, like students. People forced to radically rethink what we thought we knew and struggling to learn under an avalanche of new responsibilities in the face of extreme uncertainties, even trauma. And I'm not just talking about learning how to use Zoom or Canvas. In the spring of 2020, I saw instructors who'd never before really consider the emotional aspects of teaching and learning begin to understand in a whole new way that learning is really, really hard for their students and for themselves. Here's where a pedagogy of care extends to faculty themselves. We structure and scaffold our subject matter to help students build and practice new skills. So too must we treat ourselves and other instructors with care compassion, and kindness as we all grapple with new information, new responsibilities, and a host of daily uncertainties, stressors, and trauma.
Here are some books that can really help us battle the super teacher myth. Stephen J. Brookfield, The Skillful Teacher on Technique, Trust, and Responsiveness in the Classroom. David Gublar, The Missing Course, Everything They Never Taught You About College Teaching. Harriet Schwartz, Connected Teaching, Relationship, Power, and Mattering in Higher Education. And throughout my book, Geeky Pedagogy, I encourage readers to cultivate a growth mindset about teaching. In addition to the published scholarship of teaching and learning, an energetic community of practice can help us stay grounded in realistic and applicable solutions and strategies for teaching and learning. Mine is on academic Twitter, where you can find a community of teacher scholars sharing a ton of good information and ideas. Some final questions to consider. How has the super teacher myth shaped your views of teaching? What can we do to get support and encouragement for teaching with a growth mindset? What can we learn about pedagogy, about students, and about ourselves when we are teaching in troubled times? Conclusion. Pedagogy nerds, assemble. Our big brains are our superpower, and we will meet this challenge the best way we know how, with studying, reflection, discussion, increasing our knowledge, and with a pedagogy of care for student learning and for our own learning as educators. We can keep teaching and learning now and in the post-pandemic era. Thank you so much for joining me today. Please stay in touch and stay safe. Teach long and prosper. <laughs>